Hi, this video is a follow-up to my previous video where I answered the three response questions on the 2022 AP Stats exam. You can find that in the link above. In this video, I grade my own answers according to the official rubric. What I'm hoping to achieve in this video is that you can familiarize yourself with the way the AP Stats rubric works. I am an AP reader, so I am aware that there are ways the reading rubric is kind of peculiar. I definitely think that an AP student needs to know how the AP Stats rubric typically works so you don't lose points simply for not writing something down. You can find the links to both my answer and the official rubric in the description section. In preparing this video, I showed my paper to my fellow AP Stats readers who were grading those questions and they gave a grade. At this time, I'd like to thank all those friends. Sidi Eng at Servite High School in Anaheim, California. Jennifer Huppert at John Jay High School in Hopewell Junction, New York. Ben Kirk at Ithaca High School in Ithaca, New York. Rudy Medina at Canutillo High School in El Paso, Texas. Nicholas Simonetti at the Early College at Guilford in Greensboro, North Carolina. And Mary Veles at Roy C. Ketchum High School in Wappingers Falls, New York. Now on to the grading. Typically, the way a question is graded is that it is broken into parts and each part is given a letter grade. Sometimes the question already comes with parts A, B, C, D. Other times the question is just one question and the separation into parts is done during the grading process and the students don't know ahead of time how the parts are separated. Each part is then given a grade of either E, P, or I. E is short for essentially correct, P for partially correct, I for essentially incorrect. So E is best, P is second best, and I is no good. Where do the E, P, or I come from? Each part requires that you fulfill certain steps or certain components. So each question is divided into parts, then each part is divided into components. If you get all components, you get an E. Sometimes the rubric can be a little bit more permissive and you get almost all components and you get an E. If you get fewer than that, you get a P. If you get no components, or maybe only one component, you get an I. If a question is broken into three parts, a student could get EEE -E -E or EPI or IEP, etc. If a question is broken into four parts, a student could get EPPI or IEEE -E -E or EPPP, etc. Based on those letter grades, the full question gets a numerical score from 0 to 4. For a three-part question, the numerical score is typically like this. EEE -E -E is a 4. EEP -E is a 3. EEI, EPP, EPI, or PPP is a 2. And then EII or PPI is a 1. Everything lower is a 0. PII or III is a 0. You can see that a 0 doesn't mean you got everything wrong. PII, for example, is a 0 even though you get something partially correct. Even an III could mean for each subpart, you got some tiny piece that's correct, but each piece is so tiny, the rubric considers it essentially incorrect. The most common grade is usually a 2. The gap between e EI and PPP is typically pretty wide, but they are both a 2. 
that's how the scale typically works if a question is broken into three parts. There are times where the conversion from letters to numbers don't follow this chart, but this is typical. Now, if a question is broken into four parts, typically the rubric would say to give numerical value to each grade. An E is one point, a P is half point, and an I is zero points. Then add up the points. If something falls between whole numbers, for example, E, P, P, P adds to one plus a half plus a half plus a half equals two and a half points. Then is it two or is it three? The reader is supposed to use what's called holistic grading. You look at the entire answer and you ask yourself, is this more like a two or more like a three? A two is defined as a developing response, and a three is defined as a substantial response. Is this response substantial, or is it just developing? Based on that holistic review, the reader then marks as two or three points. That's how things generally works. Now let's apply to my answer paper. Question one. Part A asks for a description of the relationship. Here's my answer. By the way, I'll mostly just move quickly. Feel free to hit pause if you need to read something or slow down. Let's now take a look at the rubric. This rubric is typical of how AP stats requires of describing a scatter plot. You need all four of these things plus context. Component one is direction. Component two, strength, weak or strong. Component three, linear or nonlinear. Any unusual features, any special points such as outliers or influential points. And then you also need number five, context. Context is a big deal in AP stats. A paper always loses points if there are no context. And by context, they mean the verbal real life situation the question is about. This question is about bullfrogs and their lengths and masses. That's the context. The answer must say that. Look at the scoring guide right here. Context is component five. To get an E, a answer can miss one of the components one through four, but cannot miss component five context. To get a P, an answer that has context only needs one of the other components one through four, but an answer without context needs at least three of the others. You can see how important context is to the grading process. If you look at the additional notes down here, the context is satisfied if the paper says something about the length and mass and they will accept it without saying the word bullfrog. Let's go back to my paper. Here's direction, strength, form, and context. I didn't say anything about whether or not there are outliers, so I'm missing out on component four, but that's okay. The rubric says if I got three components between one through four, and then I got component five, that's an E. Moving to part B. Part B asks to identify and interpret the slope. You got the slope from the equation here. The word identify, means I must have the numerical answer. The number 6.086 need to be in the answer. The word interpret on the AP exam always requires context. Let's look at the rubric. That's component two right here. You need to say something about length and mass of the bullfrogs. Saying X and Y is no good. Also check out component three. 
most statistical results are estimated or predicted or generalized from limited sample data. So there's always some degree of uncertainty. The AP stats wants you to write it down. Back to my paper. The slope is here for component one. The contact is here for component two. And for component three is the would expect here. I got an E on this part. Scrolling down. Part C asks for an interpretation of the coefficient of determination. Again, the word interpret means I need the context, which I got here. Let's see what the rubric says. See, right here, right answer, and context to get an E. No context is a P. Reasonable but wrong answer, and yet you have context, that's also a P. I got the right answer and context E. Now part D, it has two supports. Support I asks to find the largest residual in support II, ask whether it's an overestimate or underestimate and explain why. What I wanted to emphasize is this. In AP stats rubrics, anything that involves a comparison, you must emphasize must write down on paper what is larger than what or what is smaller than what. Here, 430 is higher than 351 and I had to say that it's higher. Good thing that I have the word above there. Without that word above, I'd lose points and fall from an E down to a P. For example, if you only write the predicted mass is 430 gram while the actual mass is 351 grams, then that is no good. You may think that it's obvious that 430 is more than 351, but an AP stats rubric would require you to say it. You can see it here based on a comparison. And what counts as a comparison? Let's scroll down and look at the additional notes. By the way, if you're an AP stats teacher and you're trying to familiarize yourself with the rubrics, always read the additional notes. Those are the things that make a difference for your students' papers. The first bullet, the second bullet, and the fourth bullet require that you explicitly show which number is higher. The third bullet is a little bit more permissive, so maybe you can get away with it. By the way, when you look through old rubrics, you may find a question here and there that seem a little bit permissive. Don't assume that that kind of openness or permissiveness will repeat itself in other questions or other years. Anyway, back to my paper. I identified the correct point for support I. I had the word above for comparison and I correctly answered that is an overestimate. So I get E on this part as well. Overall, I get E, 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 E. Each E is worth one point equals four points. Thank you to my friends, City Ang of Servite High School in Anaheim, California, and Jennifer Huppert of John Jay High School in Hopewell Junction, New York, for grading this answer. Now, question two. This was a question that I myself graded during the reading. I graded one international question, and then we were done with that. I got moved to question two. Part A asked to identify the treatment, experimental units, and response variable. I got the response variable correct, the experimental unit correct, but I did not get the treatments correct. There are two treatments here, 
the drug and the placebo. I only identified the drug, not the placebo, so I lost points. Let's look at the rubric. Component one identifies the treatment as new drug and placebo. Component two identifies the experimental units as the 72 people. And component three identifies the response variable as the improvement in acne severity. I got component two and three, but not component one. So this part is a P. Part B asks to describe a statistical advantage. Let's look at the rubric. Component one here. The way the rubric interprets this question is that the student must identify an advantage in the inferential statistics phase of the experiment. An advantage in other parts of the experiment doesn't count. Also component two, the question asks for what is better. That's a comparison question. And this component requires a comparison word. Then component three is context. Look at my answer. I identified two advantages, but they relate to the experiment design and computational phases of the experiment. So I don't get component one. I did not use a comparison word, so I'm not getting component two. You relate this back to question one. Remember I said, if there's a comparison, you need a comparison word or math symbol. I should have taken my own advice here. Something like it is better to have, right? Then I would have gotten component two. I had context. I got component three. Overall, part B have an advantage, just not the advantage they're looking for. And I got context. So it's P. Now part C. Describe the random assignment. My answer is perfectly good, but it's not an E answer. Guess what I didn't say? Here's the thing. It's perfectly good process to flip a coin, but after doing it for one pair of twins, I must make sure that the person running the experiment, like a lab assistant or something, do it again for the next set of twin and the next set of twins. I should have said, repeat for all pairs of twins, or for each pair of twins, do this. Look at the process. They require component three. Any experiment design question, the AP statistics rubric requires you to write down all the steps so that someone like a robot can carry it out correctly. If you don't tell them to repeat, they won't repeat. So on this part C, I'm getting a P as well. Overall question two, I get P, 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 which is a two. I'd like to thank Nicholas Simonetti of the Early College at Guilford in Greensboro, North Carolina for grading my question two. Moving on to question three. Part A asks for a normal computation. This rubric right here is the typical rubric for how AP stats grades a normal probability question, exactly like this, these three components. Component one must identify that it is normal, its mean, and its standard deviation. When I write n, mu equals 0. 0.6, sigma equals 0. 0.04, I satisfy this component. Component two must identify the event, cutoff point, and direction. I satisfy this component when I wrote down this a less than 0.5. I would also get points for drawing the graph this way. Drawing the graph is another way of getting that component. And component three is 
the numerical answer 0 0.0062, which I had. These three components are how a normal probability question is always graded on the AP exam. So make sure you always have them. Let's read the additional notes for alternative ways of getting the points. You could get component by showing a graph with the mean and standard deviation, using words, using standard notation, or calculator speak with the parameters. Specifically for the normal distribution, use of the letter Z to represent the standard normal distribution and computing the Z-score correctly. So that includes the mean and the standard deviation. And you get component one identifying the normal distribution. In component two, when you're supposed to show work on your normal distribution, you can use the graph showing the boundaries and direction. You can use words showing the boundary and direction. You can use standard notation for the probability P or the Z score, or you can use calculator function syntax. Now, traditionally, calculator speak is not acceptable on the AP. However, within the last two or three years, the more recent rubrics tend to be more permissive and accepting of using calculator speak as showing work. However, you still must show the meaning of all the numbers. If you don't have the words showing that the mean is 0.3 and standard deviation is 0.04, people can't be expected to know how your calculator works. The meaning of all the numbers, you have to explain it. If you don't explain it, you don't get it. Back to my paper, I got all components, so I get an E in part A. Now part B. Part B has two subparts. Support I asks to identify the random variable of interest and how it is distributed. Underfilled or not, is a binary or Bernoulli or yes, no variable. So I'm pretty sure many of you recognize that this should be a binomial variable. And subpart II asks for a calculation. Now let's look at the rubric. This is a typical rubric for the binomial question. This question three is really nice because you know both the typical rubric for normal distribution and the typical rubric for binomial distribution. You need components one and two to identify the binomial distribution. First, you have to identify the variable and you have to say this binomial with the parameters that define it, namely N and P sample size and probability of success. You can analogize this to the normal distribution. The normal distribution is uniquely defined by its mean and standard deviation, so you need those two numbers. The binomial distribution is uniquely defined by the sample size and the probability of success, so you need those two numbers. Then for the calculation, you need component three to work and component four the answer. Let's talk about component two and three. Component two is to identify the distribution. And the way AP stats does it is, quote, by name or formula. Let's look at the additional notes. By name or by formula. This third bullet is by calculator speak. Recently, it seems to be more acceptable. How about component three, the calculation? The model answer uses a formula, but you don't have to use manual calculation. You can show a binomial graph with the appropriate areas. You can use words. 
you can use a formula. So actually, if you do use a formula, you meet both component two and component three. So that's good. But be careful about how you write the formula, right? Um, you can use mathematical um, expressions. Or you can use calculator speak. Back to my paper, I identified the variable. I identified it as binomially distributed. I got the N and the P is located in the raw subpart, but the rubric allows for it. So I got components one and two. I got the work and the answer. I got components three and four. I got all four components, that's an E. Part C, they come up with a new scenario and they ask which programming you would recommend and provide a statistical justification. I redid the calculations by recomputing the probability. And I say that there is a higher chance of rejection. So going back to original programming is better. Let's look at the rubric. Uh, you could compare z-score or you could compare probability. Either way, for example, I was choosing to compare probability. For the new programming, I correctly computed 0 0.023, so I got that component. And then component two is to provide a correct conclusion based on a comparison. Let's go down to the additional notes. This second bullet here is an open secret of the AP stats. Nobody says it, but everybody knows it, or you should know it. If you cannot calculate something, you can just make up a number. It incorrectly computes the probability. And then you provide a correct conclusion based on that. Then you get a P. You don't get zero. You get some points. So back to my paper, I got the correct calculation. I made the recommendation based on the correct comparison. So I got both components one and two. This is an E. Overall, I have E, 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 four points. Thank you to Ben Kirk of Ithaca High School in Ithaca, New York for grading my question three. Question four. Question four is asked in two parts A and B, but what the rubric does is that it breaks part A into three subparts to be graded separately. So together, question four has four subparts. Part A asks to construct and interpret a 95% confidence interval. What the rubric does is separate out part A into three sections. And those of you who are taught or who teach confidence interval using the state plan do conclude template, you may recognize that section one is state, section two is plan and do, and section three is conclude. Section one, identify the appropriate procedure as one sample Z interval. Note the phrasing here, by name or formula. See, I told you it's AP stats standard operating procedure. Here's an extra way of getting it. If you computed the correct confidence interval, the idea is if you correctly computed the interval, you must have known what the procedure is. I appreciate this part of the rubric, not everyone uses the state plan do conclude template. So if they can show they know the procedure in some other way, they should be rewarded for it. In my paper, I have CI of P using Z, that's component one. And I define P as the uh, parameter. So I get both components one and two. I got E on section one. 
Section two asks you to check conditions and do the calculation. For one proportion confidence interval on the AP, you can see the conditions in components one, two, and three. Component one, the sample must be random. Component two, the sample must be independent. And you get that from the sample being less than 10% of the population. Component three is the success failure condition, uh, also known as a large sample condition, that there are at least 10 successes and 10 failures, and you do have to calculate the numbers out. And then the correct interval is component four. In the model answer, they use the formula and manual calculations to compute the interval. In this particular exam, uh, supporting work is not required for component four. Going back to my paper, I have random, I have independent because it's less than 10% of all teens. I computed the number of success and failures and I show that they are greater than 10. So I got components one, two, and three, and then I got the endpoints. So I got components four. Section two, I got E. That's the end of the construct part of the question. Section three of part A would be the interpret part. My interpretation is we are 95% confident the true proportion of teens who would say they use video streaming every day is between 0.558 and 0.622. Let's look at the rubric. Component one in the rubric is often referred to as the degree of uncertainty. When you do inferential statistics, you're trying to generalize from one sample to the whole population. So you're never sure of your answer. Any inferential statistics answer that does not include the correct degree of uncertainty automatically loses points. For confidence interval and hypothesis testing, always make sure you have the degree of uncertainty. Words like we are 95% confident or there is sufficient evidence that. And that's component one. Component two is the context. That's always required for AP stats. Look at the additional notes, first bullet point. If you get the wrong answer for the CI, but you used it consistently in the conclusion, you got component one. And with context, you got component two. That's an E. It's the same open secret again. If your calculator dies or something, just make up some numbers, make sure the numbers make sense, and write your conclusion correctly in context using the made up numbers. You get E for the conclusion and at least a one on the question. In my paper, I got both components. That's the degree of uncertainty. That's the parameter in the context, and that's the correct answer. So I'll get E on this. Now moving on to part B. The question wants you to realize that the number 0 0.5 is not in the confidence interval, and therefore 0 0.5 is not a plausible value. The rubric is straightforward. Component two, you must realize that 0 0.5 is not in the interval, and component one says to answer correctly. Look at the additional notes here. Same thing again, if in part A you made up some numbers and now you apply those numbers consistently, you get full credit on part B. In this case, I uh, got the correct answer and I said the 0.5 is not in the confidence interval. I got both components, it's an E. Overall, I have E, 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 adding up to four points. A big thanks to Rudy Medina of Canutillo High School in El Paso, Texas for grading this long question. All right, question five. 
Question five has three parts. Part A asks to find and compare the medians. Oh, look, it's another comparison question. I've said this already. You must say out loud, like right on your paper, which number is higher than which number. Here it is. Inside component two of the rubric, it says the computed medians are compared correctly. Component one is that they are correctly determined with the median for dark chocolate is seven and median for white chocolate is any number between negative two and two and they would accept it. Component two is the compared correctly part and component three is the context. Let's look at my paper. I found the seven, I found the zero that is between negative two and two, seven for dark, zero for white. And I compared correctly by using the comparison word higher. And of course I got the context of the chocolate. I got all three components, that's an E. Part B, basically it asks me to say that we should not jump to conclusion from just one sample because this difference of 5.66 millimeter Hg could have happened by chance. And answering like that would have been good, except that it's not. It's not an E answer yet because the rubric is very specific on what it's looking for. So let's go to the rubric. You get an E if your response contain at least two of the following three components. Component two is what would first come through your head, right? Most people would think of it this way. Most teachers would teach it this way. Uh, but they want you to also say either one or three. Or you can do one and three and skipping the two, and that's fine too. Number three would say that, yeah, that's not enough. Looking at one sample is not enough. You have to do inference. And component one says there's a difference in there's some variability in the sampling distribution. Or equivalently, you can say that a different sample mean could have resulted from a different random assignment. So any two of these would do. Well, if you look at my answer, you would have thought that this would spread here, would match what the rubric is looking for in terms of the variability, right? But not enough, because the word spread here means variability, yes. But it could refer to the variability within, within this sample. And that's not the same as sampling variability. That would be the variability in the sampling distribution. And I didn't have enough words to specify that. So I'm not gonna be getting that component. To get an E, I need two out of three components. I only get one out of three, that's a P. So in this part B, I get a P. Part C shows this simulation. And then it asks, whether or not the results from the 25 participants in the study provide convincing statistical evidence where the difference in mean that was given in part B was 5.66. So the cutoff here at 5.66 is the sample that they are looking the, that they are talking about. And they are asking basically for a hypothesis test using this simulation. So some of you may have learned um, your Statistics with simulation, in which case this is a piece of cake for you. Those of you who did not learn using simulation, um, you can still get this if your teacher uses the activity called the smelling Parkinson's activity. Because in that activity, you simulate exactly this kind of situation and you would have gotten this. But the idea is this is your test statistic. This. The sample data is the equivalent of the test statistic or the t-test in this case. The tail end has three out of 120 uh, simulations. So that's the p-value. The p-value is three divided by 120. 
So that's that's what they are expecting you to do, and that's what I did in the um, in the answer. So let's see what the rubric says. The rubric says you get an E if you calculate the correct p-value of 0.025. Number two is you provide supporting work to show where that p-value comes from. Uh, number three, component three, is that you provide correct conclusion in context. So this is just like doing a conclusion in any hypothesis test question. And then you justify by comparing p-value to 0.05. Let's look at the additional notes. Component two, the part where you need to show work on where your p-value comes from. All you need to show is that there are three dots that are in the tail that show a difference of at least 5.66. Okay, that's all you need. You found the three. That means you know how to identify the p-value on the graph. Then you get credit for component two showing work as to where the p-value comes from. So let's go back to my answer. I actually wrote down the H0 and HA. The rubric says I didn't need to. Um, I have the work of three out of 120 and the correct p-value. So that's components two and component one. I correctly compare p-value with alpha equals 0.05. So that's component four. And I correctly wrote down the verbal conclusion in context. So I get component three. So I got one, two, three, four, all four components. This part is an E. Overall, for this question five, I got E, P, E, which is a three. Thanks go to Mary Veles of Roy C. Ketchum High School in Wappingers Falls, New York, for grading my question five. Last question, question six. Question six on the AP exam is always what's called the investigative task where you're given a situation and so they discover something about statistics that's not in the AP curriculum. For this year, the topic is Simpson's Paradox. Question six has four parts, A, B, C, D. Each is graded separately. Part A, subpart I, ask for the relative frequency at each clinic. Because it says each clinic, the total for each clinic, meaning each column, needs to add to one or 100%. So you need to divide by the column total. Subpart II asks to see which clinic seems to be more successful. That reinforces that in support I, you needed to divide by the column total because then you can see the clinic A has a 0.633 success rate, which is higher than at clinic B. Again, note that the question asks which clinic is more successful, which is comparison word. Then in the answer, you need to say which success rates is higher. Like I have the word higher here. Let's look at the rubric. You get essentially correct an E. If you got component one, the response to part AI provides the correct numerical values here. And the response to part AII identifies the clinic that is more successful and includes a justification. Let's look at the model solution. The model solution to subpart II. If you look through it, you may not see a comparison word, but it is there. This word only here is acceptable as a comparison word that says that number is lower. So back to my paper, I got the correct answers here. I correctly identify clinic A and I correctly justifies with the comparison. So I got E for part A. Part B, ask if it's okay to conclude that something causes something else. Causation here. 
in intro stat, the rule of thumb is that an observational study can only show association or correlation while you need a randomized controlled experiment to prove causation. Once you get more advanced, you learn more ways of proving causation. But regardless, this kind of just looking up past records and computing a few percentages can never prove causation. So I said in my answer here, that is an observational study and cannot establish causation, only association. Let's look at the rubric to see what it says. Well, the rubric has two components. Component two, look at this. You're okay if you say it's only an observational study. If you say it's not a randomized experiment, remember in intro stats or AP stats, only randomized experiment can prove causation. Or alternatively, the third bullet, is that maybe you didn't say the word observational study, you didn't say the word randomized experiment, but you show an understanding as to why an observational study is no good because there could be confounding variables that are not controlled for. So if you have any one of those things, you get component two, which is the reasoning. And then look at component one. The question asks you something, you have to answer it. You have to say no. So let's go back to my paper. I have my reasoning that it is an observational study. And I also said no. It's a yes or no question. You have to say either yes or no. So I got both components. That's an E. But C has a mosaic plot. You don't really need to know how to read mosaic plots because each block is labeled with the actual number of patients. There are two supports to part C. Support I asks for each clinic which allergy severity they're good at. The answer is mild for both. If you look at the number of mild, successful mild, and the successful severe, or you can just look at mosaic part and see that this line is higher than that line. Same thing in clinic B. And support II asks for each clinic, which type of allergy did they actually get? So they are both better at treating mild allergy, but for clinic A, they got more mild allergies, but clinic B got more severe allergies. Let's take a look at the rubric and see what it's asking for. The rubric has four components. Components one and two have to do with part I, subpart I. And component one is the correct answer. Component two is showing work. And same thing for subpart II. Component three is the correct answer. And component four is showing work. Back to my paper, I got the correct answer for both ports and it was showing work. So for C, I got an E. Now port D. This is the heart of Simpson's paradox. Clinic B is actually better than clinic A at both types of allergies. As you can see from port C. Let me roll it, scroll back up to port C so you can see. In port C, I, Clinic B has a 91% success rate for mild allergy, better than Clinic A at 75%. For severe allergies, Clinic B is at 75%, better than Clinic A at 28.6%. But if you look back all the way to part A, Clinic B has an overall lower success rate than Clinic A which is totally unfair. Clinic B is better than A in everything, but overall A comes out looking better. That's the idea of Simpson's paradox. In part D, they asked for an explanation. So I gave my uh, answer, although Clinic B is more successful in both types, overall A is more successful because A is good at treating mild IG and had more mild cases. B is good at treating myology, but had more severe cases. 
all which is true, but it's not an E answer. All right, let's take a look at the rubric. The rubric requires that for an E answer, you need two components, one and two. One is that you need to compare within each clinic, mild versus severe, or the overall proportion of treating mild versus severe. So I have to have a comparison of mild versus severe success rate, either within each clinic or overall. Whereas component two wants a comparison of mild severe between A and B. And you could do it in one of three ways, either compare the proportion of mild in A versus mild in B, that's the first way, or compare the proportion of severe in B versus severe in A, that's the second way. Or the third way is to compare the ratio within A and then within B. Okay, so either way, any one of these three ways would work. Looking back, what I have is A had more mild cases, B had more severe cases, so that satisfies component two. But I never compared the success rate of severe versus mild. Simpson paradox only works if certain things are met. And one of it is that the mild ratio is much higher than the severe ratio. And then whoever got more severe would be like penalized, right? I needed component one and I didn't have component one. For this part D, I only have one out of two components. That's a P. And overall, I get E, 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 P. And in a four part question, every E is count as one point, every P is count as half a point, E, 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 P adds up to three and a half points. Overall, this is what my friend, the reader said, E, 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 P rounded up to four. So thanks to Nicholas Simonetti of the Early College at Guilford in Greensboro, North Carolina for grading this question. Well, that's that. That's the graining of my paper. I hope you learned something about the way the AP Stats rubric works. Some of the lessons that I myself learned throughout my years as a reader, and of course with this exam specifically, are always include at least some context. If there's a comparison to be made, write the comparison down, like less than or more than. Number three, anything that's conceptually important, say it out loud. I'd refer back to question five, where there's a variation in the sampling distribution. That's conceptually different from variation in the sample itself. So that's why when I said spread, it was not accepted as a full answer. If your calculator dies or you forgot how to calculate something, make up some numbers. Then continue on and get the partial credits for the parts that follow that. Make sure the number that you make up makes sense. If it's a proportion or a probability or p-value, make sure it's zero point something. Overall though, because at the end of the day, the thousands and thousands of paper must be curved into a scale from zero to five, a few P's here and there, and maybe even a few I's won't kill you, especially if you did really well in the multiple choice part. A few P's in your paper and you're still five. You get a few more P's and a few I's, you're still a four, which is good enough for college credit. All right, any questions, ask in the comments. Any additional thoughts? Also put in the comments. If you're an AP Stats teacher or an AP Stats reader, I'd love to hear your thoughts about this, especially if you have a different take on anything that I've said. Like, share, and subscribe for more contents. Thanks for watching. Bye, and good luck with the AP.